The following program was produced by an independent community producer. The opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of the ECAT staff or board of directors. <laughs> Start. Uma is a, a genius at putting together PowerPoints, and um, before we get too far, I'm going to try to set the scene about what this area was like when Quisit House was built. And now, since Ed is here, I'm not sure I should be doing this part <laughs> of, the pro <laughs> of, the, of the program. But it, this is also personal to me because there are things that I learned while I was here that I would like to know more about and as time goes on I have an opportunity to learn a little more about what went on here and um, so actually we're talking about 171 years ago now to, for a house to be um, standing for 171 years in, in this situation is pretty remarkable and it's a very beautiful house but just going back a little bit, it was built by the Ameses, as people know, but Ames started making shovels in 1815. They were um, big manufacturing in other cities around Brockton and other places around here. But by 1853, across the street, they were making, they had 330 workmen working, making 600, thousand dollars worth of shovels that was their revenue in in 1853 and that is 24 million dollars in today's money so this was not a small operation you know and the fact that someone one of the Ameses um, built this house in 186, uh, 1853 he was right in the middle of what was going on must have been loud noisy and dirty around that time but it was built and um, 1865, as as we um, before we go past the slide, yeah, 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 Marilyn, yeah, 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 yeah sure. The room slaughter us. This photo is not from 1853. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's much later, but it's the earliest one we could find in a hurry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, in 18, let's see, where are we? This was built across from the shovel factory, as I <laughs> said, and and the the phrase there was a home, a tasteful cottage on a smiling lawn is just one of the um, maxims that come from uh, the Down Downing who designed the house and was, um, I mean, he wrote, a, he had a book of country house designs and this house, this house was based on that. And uh, there were several very moralistic maxims about what a, the value of a home. So it's kind of fun to think about the fact that this was built with that spirit and all these years later we're making these lovely things happen here as well. Okay. So 60% um, <laughs> of the world's entire production of shovels. So um, one of the things I read is that at some point there was a fire at one of the buildings, and there were, and the way they put it, there were twelve. There were basically were twelve thousand shovels just in a storage area that were destroyed in this fire. So it it was it was a big operation. Um, so Oaks renovated. They renovated the house with John Ames Mitchell, um, who lived here. Um, did he live here? Did we? Are we he was involved. He was an architect. He was the architect of Unity Church. He was the editor of uh, Life magazine. And um, he and this was all before the library. And we have a keep going through the history part a little bit. 
go ahead. Yeah. Uma, you want to jump in? No, no, no. <laughs> Winthrop, Winthrop Ames uh, lived here in the 30s or the 1890s to 1930s time frame. And this was a person who was uh, very involved with the theater. He's known as the gentleman producer of Broadway. Um, he had a lot of friends who came here. And in fact, Leslie Howard, George Arliss, and Catherine Cornell are the ones that we memorized because some of us don't remember them and some do. And um, Leslie Howard is the one who was uh, in Gone with the Wind. I was just walking in the hallway below and two people were talking about the house, two visitors. And one was telling them, oh yes, this is a place that famous actors came. And they must have heard us speaking at some point. So um, Bill Ames uh, and I, and just before we leave the Broadway uh, part, I think Karen, were you with us the day we went to New York for, no, no, no. okay. Some of the pictures that we have of Winthrop Ames, especially the one with the derby hat that's down on the wall when we first come in. Um, we found at the Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, we actually took a trip to New York and po combed through this very prestigious library that has the picture history, the media history of Broadway and everything, and we found what we wanted to find about the, the Ames, uh, Winthrop Ames. Um, so the stage was designed, and um, that is actually in that first picture that we saw. It's actually there, right. So visualize the setting in that time frame. Let's go back a little bit. Um, the garden was 1911, actually. That's pretty far back. Um, the library, 1883. So the library was, um, was built at that point. In, um, 18, 1931, if you go on next, I'm not sure we have, we're not there yet. <laughs> and, um, 1931, the expansion of the library took place. You and I haven't talked about that too much, but I thought we should mention that in the middle of all this that was going on, the library got built, Oak Ames Hall got built, and then in the 31, Fanny Holt Ames, who was um, a board member of the library, from 1931 to 56 donated the construction of the children's wing. So um, all that went on and, uh, up to 1931 and then going on got to be a little shaky as to what was going on here. You can read some of that. Various Ames family members uh, passed the house on to each other. Um, Quisit House was damaged because people were kind of using it for fun, coming in and hanging out. Um, and, and Pat Jacobson, 19th, so, go ahead. So Madeline, Pat is here. Hey, Pat is it? not here, so <coughs> can, you both, can you both of you talk a little bit about your stay here and how it was? Because Pat had lovely photos that sadly we didn't have access to at this point. Well, we were letting workmen in and out for quite a while. I remember them taking a whole week just to paint the ceiling in, in the downstairs, the common room mm -hmm. there. It was so water damaged. Um, and we were just taking care of the house so while, what, they were, while they were renovating. What was this room, for example? This was just empty. Yeah. The upstairs, we didn't use this part of the house. We were in the back of the house where the book sale is, that was my kitchen. <laughs> Interesting. And the common room was my living room and dining area. And then the front rooms were just the, the old library and the two other front rooms. Those those were empty and they weren't they weren't really uh, refurbished yet. But they were working on it. The, what's the kitchen downstairs now was just a butler's pantry and when I entertained it was very convenient. <laughs> there was a sink and there were places for all my dishes and yeah. I could go in and out of this okay. living room, dining room area. And I remember you telling us about big Easter egg hunts. Oh yes. With, all, with your family. And all yes, that. yes. We started a tradition of having Easter egg hunts in, in the side garden. Yeah. Huh. With, uh, so the children were, my daughter was just a toddler and my son was in nursery school. Uh, 
Well, we, we've been saying that the, the vandalism was going on. Was it apparent to you or was it after you left? That no, was before we Before came. you came. That's okay. why we were here. We were here okay. to watch over the house so that as it, it was being fixed up, Mrs. Parker didn't want them to get in again and do damage. Okay, okay. So when did Hazel uh, see all this damage that she's quoting here? It's in the, six, six, the, late, six, the late 60s. The late 60s, okay. My goodness. <laughs> That's what Madeline and I were talking about, the absolute magic of this, this mansion. That, I mean, if I lived back in the 19th century and walked down the road, you know, you always say, I wonder what lives are being lived in that beautiful place. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes a little home, and then it becomes the community's home. So. There's a bit of magic there. Yeah. Move uh, on? Okay, move on? Yeah. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> Billy. <laughs> so much like her. Yeah. She used to call me when the daffodils were in bloom behind the library on the hill where the parking lot is. There used to be a hill. Yeah. And she'd get on the phone and she'd say, Pat, go pick the daffodils before the... The um, neighbors picked them. Okay. <laughs> 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 uh, okay. Well, that is a beautiful picture of Bill, and who are you yeah. saying he looks like? Um, he looks like Jimmy Stewart. Jimmy Stewart, yes. right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah okay. absolutely. So then, then um, uh, yes. she gives Quisset House to Bill. Bill moves in, um, and David Ames um, purchased the house and uh, eventually sold it to Doug King, who's a local developer, I'm sure everybody knows. And Uma was reminding me that Doug King actually, first of all, he did a lot of work in the house, but his plan was to use the house as a sort of a focal point for a senior community that he wanted to build um, in, on the land back here. So he eventually didn't do that, but he was the first person to visual first person. He visualized the use of this house as a center for community activity. So that idea started back in those days. Uh, he was going to make us senior community. This would be their community center, and he would open it to the public, including people who didn't live here. So um, what happened next? Then he sold it to Forest Systems, which was a company that actually had the house uh, as their offices during the time when I first joined the library staff. So I was here in 1998 and uh, the library renovation was probably being talked about at that time. Do you have any board members who, if, if it had started that early, but yeah. um, we, we really didn't have what we wanted to have as a library. We wanted to build a new library, and I don't know what we have on the next slide, Uma, maybe we should, um, oh, okay, here we go. Um, so 98, 2002, um, all those years, the board was trying to expand the library and build um, a different kind of place, renovate the existing building, have um, a, a theater kind of thing in the back, and that, um, that idea ran out of steam after a number of protests to that happening because for a lot of reasons, but um, in the time that it took to settle various lawsuits re revolving around environmental issues and historical issues, it got so expensive that they couldn't build the library any longer. So they couldn't build the extension. Um, now, where am I in my chronology is um, we moved out of, the, so the plan was to renovate the library. And during that, that time, um, we moved all the books out of the main library, um, went to Frothingham Hall, had a temporary library with a book brigade, came back. Um, and at, we had purchased the Cuisset House, but we weren't at all sure how we were going to use it. Um, and there was this little cottage across the street that's now a floral house, a floral business, um, and that was used as a teen center for a while, as a, as a tutoring center. These were all kind of missions that the library wanted to pursue, they wanted to do more things with the community, for the community. Um, 
And so it, it was um, various fits and starts. So what happened basically is when I say win Best Small Library Award, I just wanted to say that once we got back from Frothingham Hall, we had the Barrel Vault Room open, which had been um, a space for long shelving. Before we moved out, it was the fiction center, and there was no room for anything. When we moved back, um, thanks to Uma and a lot of energy, we had lots of programs in the Barrel Vault Room. And we had to move tables out every time, and um, we still, I think we had probably started working on Cleaset House. We'd started thinking of how we were going to use it, but... Karen, do you have memories of that? Because I know when I joined, I was told it was going to turn into a children's library, and my heart just sank. <laughs> I said, this is a horrible idea. <laughs> well, uh, as I remember, uh, Cleaset House came, you know, it, it was clear that we were not going to build an addition on the back of the library. So uh, there seemed to be... We seemed to be boxed in. There was no way to expand. And we tried the little house across the street, and it was, it was not successful. Um, so when we found out the Cuisset House was going to be for sale, we knew we needed to buy it, but we had no idea how to use it. Um, because it was not the kind of space that we had been hoping to build on the back of the library, which was going to be a big space. It was going to have meeting rooms and a performance room, and that's not what this is. But it was obvious that was the only way to expand, and um, we'd saved a lot of money um, by not renovating the library and building an addition, so we had money to buy it. And we spent quite, a, I think, a few years trying to figure out how to basically divide what a library does into two separate buildings. And for a long time, we were stuck on making this a children's library. It would have its own checkout system, um, trying to figure out how to configure that the book sale room and the dining room into any kind of usable space. And it was like, you know, butting your head against the wall. And luckily, both Madeline and Uma were very adamant that this, this was not working. This was not going to work. We didn't know what would work, but it wasn't that. And so, we did due diligence, Madeline. We oh, yeah. To, we went to the Athenaeum uh, out in, uh, where was it? Uh, Rhode Island? Yeah, in Rhode Island. Island. I don't know. And they had turned an old mansion into a children's room. And you know, children need comfortable spaces, mm -hmm. bright colors, low furniture. Yeah, you need yeah. shabbiness and happiness. And this is such a classic building. It is. <laughs> <laughs> but we did. I, I remember meeting with furniture people yeah, and right. figuring out, you know, if we had movable shelves, then I we could, movable, mo movable shelves, shelves we could move them aside, aside and uh, then we could have play space, you know. <laughs> one of the things we did right after we purchased it, I think it was, to what year was it when we bought it? I was 2007. Board, Uma wasn't here yet. Mm -hmm. You were the director, you had just become the director of the library, but we, Nancy, I, we recruited, we had a huge recruitment event for friends of the library because the old group of friends were completely burned out from 10 years of political turmoil. Mm -hmm. So I remember we, you know, we filled that house with people who were dying to get in and we had a lot of social events. Oh yeah, everybody wanted to get in. We had cocktail parties and yeah. tastings yeah. and we had so many yeah. people coming in and out and they were so thrilled. We got a huge group of friends from that, that time. I think our first um, activity that we ran down there was a chocolate and cheese tasting. Yeah, was it? Oh yeah. 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 And I don't think we, we broke even, I don't think we made money, but goodwill. <laughs> It was all saving a glass of, I mean, no, yes. they, we had to pay, people paid, but it wasn't, we didn't end up really making yeah. any yeah. fundraising money, but the goodwill and the enjoyment that people had. Has, it, has anybody gone to that? I, that you remember that first yeah. event? Yeah. People were really enchanted. And I remember one of the controversies that happened in the community surrounding that decision about not having the children's space there, people said, can you envision young parents wanting to go look for a book themselves and the opportunity for their kids to sort of look around for a few minutes and now they're in a different space and what does yeah. that look like? And it just it just didn't it make sense, sense, but we were still trying to figure out what was a good use. So, no. and, and, sorry, I, I just remember that, that nightmare I had. Remember the, I mean, Quisit has these beautiful fold out, you know, the coal shuttles and things like that. I said, a parent looks away and a child is lost for the next 16 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I think it, it was an excellent lesson in how, in problem solving. 
because <laughs> it wasn't that, you know, we were all willing to have ideas and pick the best, what seemed to be the best one, and, and start it off, but if it didn't work out, then we switched. So in the whole process, there were many, many times where we thought we had landed on the solution, started it off, it didn't work, and then, you know, head off in another path. Yeah. But um, yeah. I have to say this, the whole staff was very good about it. <laughs> <Some flexible, laughs> <flexible. laughs> yeah. Oh, and, and it led to, I had the, the Best Small Library Award. I mean, we kept at it. We, we created programming. We did everything you guys did, the friends did. And um, I like to talk about the fact that when I, before I became a librarian, I used to travel a lot to libraries and um, for business. And I saw the best libraries that there are, usually larger libraries. Um, doing all kinds of things. And um, Uma came from Braintree, which was a bigger library. We, we, had, we had some ideas and we, we executed as many as we can. And because we were very ambitious, we applied for this, uh, the best small library grant. We just said, yeah, we're going to do that. We, we want to do that. We're going to apply for it. And I don't think anybody really thought <laughs> this would actually happen in Easton, but it did. And, and the reason I go over that is that because we had got that award, we went to Philadelphia where they gave us this award. And um, we listened to speeches. It was an American Library Association convention. And we heard people talking about what they were doing around the world and in uh, various large libraries with the concept of makerspace or geeking out or and learning commons and all these buzzy things that, uh, it was a lot of buzzwords. I, we have this brochure here, I think, we have it up there. I, I was reading over some of the buzzwords we were throwing around, <laughs> lots of them. Um, but we said, you know, I remember, Uma and I remember quite vividly being at that convention, and the way I remember it, we were on the phone with each other from across the hall. I said, Uma, we can do that, right? Yeah. You know, something <laughs> like that. And there's the, there's the library we got inspired by. The library we got inspired yeah, by. Yeah, when you're talking, oh, oh, okay. I, I'll do the banner way. You do the banner way. What is it? Okay, wait, can I see what this is? That's that the, the, the uh, Danish one? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it was 7 in the morning, and, and Alan and I were still sleeping, and I said, okay, let's go for this talk. Which was the <laughs> yeah, yeah. turning point. because. Yeah, yeah. This library in Denmark, it's called DOKK1, one, DOC1. One. It's just so fabulous, so futuristic. It's exactly this, yeah. you know, very inspirational. Yes, very inspirational. So we realized we could develop the technology space, and we started trying to do it. And we did a lot of work, a lot of, uh, a lot of what is here now wasn't done yet. I mean, the elevator wasn't done. Um, what else? You have um, to jump in there after a few slides. Our story begins. Okay, I think you, can, you want to take over. Once upon a time, go oh, on. Yeah, our story begins. Okay. So as as Madeline said, we we'll, we we'll keep switching, and please, uh, literally eighty percent of you are part of all this. And jump in whenever. Um, so, Jack, is this okay? All right. So as our story begins, and you know, Madeline, Madeline, the Madeline. <laughs> uh, had three boxes of papers, which is why you got all these details. And me being me, of course, I said, okay, I'm going to tell a story since I have no dates in my mind <laughs> and no real information. So, once on a time. <laughs> <laughs> and Uma, okay, I had a few folders of information. Uma shows up the next day with 30 oh, slides. Yeah, my dirty little secret is it's the same slide I've used for basically all the talks I've been around giving, because Quizit House was such a raging success that I turned it into my own personal, uh, my little personal story and went around the world with it. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was always once upon a time, there was a wondrous library. And you know, every time I show this, it goes, oh, that entire thing, yes, there's a garden, yes, there's a fountain, yes, there's a different learning commons. I mean, there's not too many places in the world where you have an entire 19th century mansion 
at your disposal. Mm -hmm. As I said, the element of magic to me is so strong because here's a private home that's gone through, I mean, the way Hazel, it's electrifying when Hazel tells you about the wrecking ball right outside, what, two times, three times, Nancy? Ready to go. Ready and then to what, go. there was a day that, you know, on a Monday morning, it was ready to go. And yeah. So it's, it's very providential. Yeah. It, and then it becomes Easton's adult community house. It's, it's good. So as a library, not a simple repository of books. <laughs> and that's a real library of oh, the Appalachian Mountains. And I'm not going to sniff at this because I love the repository of books at part of libraries. However, this is the really exciting part, the vibrant community space. Who's a familiar figure up left over there? Hmm. Oh, yeah. hmm. 80% of all programming. <laughs> programming is Ed. <laughs> so vibrant community space with lifelong learning for all ages. This is the other part of libraries. Please, all of you be ambassadors because you know there's this, ah, oh, everything's online now. No, it's not. The library is, is really there for you right from the start to the finish. Um, and we, you know, as, as Madeline was saying, developed it into over a thousand programs. What she talked about, the Barrow Vault Room, is you can see a bit over here, mm -hmm. because it was a nightmare every evening pushing those heavy uh, oak furniture out. But you knew what it proved was Easton needed this because it was always full. Okay. And remember, Marion, your your Valentine's Day party in the oh, Barrow Ward Room? Yes. I mean, I've never forgotten it because I had 103 temperatures. It was a pink haze. <laughs> <laughs> and Marion, in her brilliance, had put down a pink gauze from top to bottom. So the space was needed for so many different things, you know, to express community spirit. Sorry? Um, while we're talking about Marion, I think we need to say that during this period, Marion came on the scene when we were in Friday Hall, actually and started the uh, fundraising efforts that we did that included some of these fundraising events that gave us more access to the community and made us realize that the community really was interested. Which we have cold pages of. Which I want to say, this is Madeline, and probably you, but it was your brilliant idea. And, and I feel like it really was the heart of community building as well, it, you know, all these efforts bring in people from so many dimensions of Easton. Right. And I think, it, you know, right. for you to do that was a really right. Well, I have idea. to say, I, I grew up in the library field, even though I was a vendor for half my life. And I saw people doing these things. The, the whole thing about creating a, a motto where the community connects, for example, that came after uh, a convention. Now, no one had those words, but there was a whole session on community slogans. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like we didn't have guidance mentors. We do. It was a very rich field, the library profession. Yeah. So. And so this is the part you wanted to show. Oh, okay. Well, this part is what happened was um, I actually retired and stayed on for a couple of years to help develop this concept. And during this time, I was able to visit um, libraries in Chicago, in Skokie, Darien, and Connecticut, and a few other places. And I was able to see this concept in action. People were making films, making podcasts, uh, teaching people how to um, do things with the technology. Now, I was thinking about this this morning. The, te the technology, we were already using computers for everything. We already had e-books. I think the iPad had been around for a few years, but it started to feel like there was a lot. There were things that could be done with little gadgets and splicing and dicing and importing <laughs> pictures and sound tracks. And, and who, who was going to do all that? And how are we going to learn to do all that? So we, and I saw it being done at these libraries. You have to have a lot of young techies. But not only that, we, we developed a kind of community approach to it. I think that's with, OK, so yeah. the community approach. Um, you, you wanted to just talk to and just go through this? Um, you can do it, too. <laughs> <laughs> you were These there. These are the facts. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so we needed to. Um, well, we needed to do, still do renovations, as you said, the, the, uh, 
elevator was it? Yeah. Well, the big turning point actually um, is was Karen Carter. Does anybody know Karen Carter personally? She was an angel. You knew her. Yeah. I mean, she, she, I think she went before her time and um, left this wonderful, huge bequest. And thanks to that, the ideas that about the learning commons that were simmering around became, right? Um, board members, mm -hmm. right? There, there, you know, that, I think the, yeah, the ideas were waiting. I think, right. um, you know, one of the key, I, I remember being at a meeting with both of you, and I think Uma, it was you, you know, came up with this idea that we could fill this whole house with programs just based on the expertise of people who lived in town. Yes. Just ask people in town to come and do a program. We didn't have to expand a staff to do it. We had the expertise. And then the money came because we couldn't really use the building, like the building. until yeah. it was handicap accessible. Yeah. Handicapped accessible. And that, that was the critical point. Don't ever put in an elevator anywhere. <laughs> they were so expensive mm -hmm. and such a just, headache. There was a lot yes, of infrastructure that was necessary for it to be safe to bring 100 people at a time in and here. To bring anybody in. Right? We were ready to go for a long time before. We haven't mentioned we Jay Thomas, to. whose you know, work here was and Jay Thomas just pop over to the main library because he's there at the night exhibit every year. Because <laughs> every part of Jay is in every part of this entire campus. I can't just visit it. But, the, but, but that was the critical, exactly yeah. what Karen said about the elevator and so on. And then, Mad uh, Madeline, as, as Karen just pointed out, you, you didn't need 17 rooms in the house, basically. As long as you had one room, we said every time we get another dollar, the next room, <laughs> third dollar, the third room. You know, it, 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 it can be organically grow on its own with right. community support, and that's what. Um, that's what we got a few grants. Um, yeah. And then this community innovation challenge grant was a state grant that specifically asked for projects that would involve the community and in some way. Um, cut the cost of doing things for people in the community. Let me put, put it this way. The um, adult ed, for example, is not very robust, and it, or it wasn't then. I don't know if it is now. But we said, well, we could take on some of that. Mm -hmm. And um, teen programs that have come up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, I have read over the grant. and. Um, I must say it was brilliant. It addressed every every concern that the state had about why they wanted to give money, why they wanted community projects that would show innovation, consolidation, community involvement. And that was the big turning point for actually having toys in the building. Up to then, we were going on people power, but that whole digital lab room that the Friends of the Library are going to rededicate with new upgraded um, Technology was really uh, 2013 the, the challenge innovation. Yeah, that was forty thousand dollars. In fact, there are two people in there on the computers right now. I yeah. mean, young people come in, they do they tell the story about the transferring of the slides. Yes. So one of the yeah. uh, machines we got was the uh, slide, um, you know, video transfer. And I was waiting for somebody to use it, and I walk into the room, and I could see the back of somebody sitting there using it. And I said, So what do you think of this? Dead silence. I said, so rude. And I walked out. <laughs> Fortunately, I went back a little later, and he was still there. And then he turns around, and he had been weeping. And he oh. said, I'm sorry, I was transferring my wedding video. Oh. And it was a moment. Oh. You, know, you know you've done the right thing. You know? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's yeah. quite um... OK. So yeah. Take it away. Okay, so that's what we. Uh, so so this is. Th so this was part of turning our wonderful library for our community into the 21st century by adding on this component because the entire world was going through a change. I mean, this whole business of going to the library just to pick up a book was no longer, uh, uh, you know, completely uh, completing the picture. Knowledge creation has become a big thing now because everybody wants to create, and as Karen pointed out. Everybody, it's the Montessori method. Everybody has some genius in them that at least five people are willing to share. So we totally exploited that with um, 
one. Built to support individual genius of the Eastern community, which yeah. does not mean the quarter party, but <laughs> <laughs> I could not find any other picture of it. And we, we spend so much time building up. Don't forget, 170 house. years old, this house needed. She's um, a grand lady, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 there's always something, and, and Jay Thomas, the architect, Jay was quick to point it out. And, so yeah, so this was the people power, recognizing, as we said, the 21st century uh, new forms of information seeking, which is not through a book, which as you can see with our next generation is mm. through that. One-on-one um, -on -one with an expert. And wow. so we exploited staff, all of whom had incredible genius stuff, community experts, you can take a bow, Ed, um, collaborative expertise, which is all the agencies around town, and subject experts, and I'll quickly go through some pictures because pictures are fun. This is our staff skills. How many of you have gone for any of these? Ben, you're right up front there. Speak up. What were you doing there? Quilting? Uh, uh, that's Debbie. Debbie's oh, the other Oh, that's uh, Zen. You're next to us. You know, yes. Jeff, was that the uh, veterans quilts? The yes, lab quilts? That's what it was. The quilts. veterans the quilts. lab quilts. Oh, right, on the lower left. left. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Uh, to me, right. this is Kathy Corona on the left over here. Yeah. She had the most brilliant 360 degree program ever invented by humans, I think, because she started out with a group of eight knitters. Mm -hmm. And this was when we were still in, uh, we didn't have Quisit House. So Kathy Corona is sitting up there with her eight knitters. You could hear them laughing all the way down. Mm -hmm. So I went up to see what all the fun was about. Mm -hmm. And the first sight I see was this miserable 10-year-old boy <laughs> <laughs> being forced to knit along with the group. But from that group, it just kept growing until we had two knitting groups a week. It went into embroidery. It went into quilting. It went into beading. Mm -hmm. This is one sample of it um, that Debbie on the right was doing. It just the, the need for crafters to come together to talk about their lives, to create, was very strong. Mm -hmm. But that did, is not where it ended. They started selling their stuff at the library. They made enough money to buy 10 uh, sewing machines, mm -hmm. including $1,000 computerized sewing machine. And with that, they were just zipping along in terms of the quilting yeah. so that they could start donating to hospitals, to the NICU units, mm -hmm. to the the veterans, mm -hmm. which they made a special quilt mm -hmm. where it yeah, to fit over the, 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 the wheel. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's lit literally like a full circle. You know, you, 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 you have your fun, you create, you give back to the community. Mm -hmm. it's this is, brilliant. as you said, it's an, an example of exactly what we had in mind or what the government had in mind when they gave us the money. But we didn't realize how successful it could be. When this <coughs> was not, this extent. was even without government. This was literally people power. Because right. they, 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 just they made bought their, their own, own absolutely. absolutely. Right. Absolutely. But they they the library absorbed the activity is what uh, I'm uh, yes. mm -hmm. Which could have maybe needed to be funded for the adult right. community mm -hmm. center. Mm -hmm. We don't have no yes. you know, do we have one? Yes. Would they have run it? No. The library mm -hmm. was capable support, and yeah. central and yes. reached out and supported them. And when the learning comes open, this was this was the perfect room. That's why the lighting is so bright over here. This entire table is, I think, where they are sitting right there. So yes, yeah. and the sewing machines are, are right there. Okay, and then we had the community agencies. As you can see, there. This is the friends of the library who come and meet. They, you know, really develop their books here room, and they're the ones who are going to be refurbishing. The, right, Nancy, is what's the details on that? Uh, on the book uh, they're, room. Re they're refurbishing the uh, the computers, I think. The, yeah, the, yes, the computer room. That's what the yes. friends are in, and we'll They're be speaking about that at the ribbon cutting. Yes, I think, four, on, four new computers, two mm -hmm. PCs, and two Macs. Wow. When they're coming, yes. When they're coming. Wow. Um, and yes, so we and, and we have. That was opening day, I believe. We had the flash mob. Yeah, yeah, that's a yeah. flashbulb dance. Yeah, they didn't have it. Happy Happy Day. Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Day. Day. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> this was a prime moment. This, this, was, this was the staff coming an hour earlier every day to the library practice. and practicing <laughs> this thrill, thrill. What's the name? What was happy, 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 happy? I just went over it. That was just happy and you know it. Was that when you're happy and you know it. No, it was happy, happy. Oh, it yeah, was happy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. 
But it was a prime moment, I remember, because the head of the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners came for that, and her jaw dropped, and she said, I have never seen library staff so enthused. <laughs> 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 Um, agencies um, and then subject experts as you can see oh, this was a gripping talk Marion um, uh, <laughs> any time <laughs> it was for yeah. Cambodia uh, this was and look at look at Lorraine I mean Lorraine right now is known as the nature person in, in the library because she just does over the top wonderful stuff with nature um, issues but at one point for five years she would host a trip talk. Anybody went anywhere, and the idea was was simple. You want to go to Cambodia? Let me know what airline you took, what food you took, how much money you took. Very practical information, along with ten pretty pictures. Mm -hmm. Nothing more than that. Highly successful um, because you know everybody's contributing. Uh, there's Eric Lothrop. Anybody know Eric? Mm -hmm. Such a wonderful man. So he gives off his time here on photography <coughs> skills. So, you know, whatever you are, <laughs> people like vultures, right? No. <laughs> Anybody came no. in and said, oh, I need a book on gardening, and you say, oh, are you a good gardener? <laughs> are you going to talk? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. May, may I say my favorite talk? Yes. Peg's daughter, who oh. came in to oh. talk about her flight experience yeah. with yes, the air. Did. I didn't even sleep that night. <laughs> it was so, so amazing. <laughs> amazing. It, I just, I have still this beautiful picture in my classroom of, Four. Of, yeah, yeah. The four she was a F-18 pilot. She was an F-18 top, top, top gun. Like you see in the movies. <laughs> That's right. She married a top gun. <laughs> and it was funny. I'll tell you this one little story. I don't know if she told you this or not, but uh, he was uh, the adversary when they would do the, the fighting, you know, mm -hmm. practice. And so she said to him, if you shoot me down, you're not getting supper. <laughs> 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 she was electrifying, and I, I wish I could have captured this at the end of her talk. Do you remember this little kid who, do you remember that yes. end? Yes. She just comes up. Do you like bracelets? Right. She just takes out her tre treasured bracelet and hands it over as her oh. token of. That was a little girl. Little her mother, Steph, helped. She had one leg. She lost a leg in Guatemala, maybe. Yeah. And Steph helped her learn how to ride a bike when she was in elementary school. So she had heard. That Steph was going to speak. Uh, Steph had seen her years. Yeah. And uh, her daughter is the one who asked her about the bracelet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there was every kind mm -hmm. of talk. It was literally, yeah. it was as varied as we are as a, as a human species because everybody, you know, was interested in something else, including, what was it? I mean, I mean our, our poor, our poor uh, custodian, the cleaning lady who came once a week, um, I saw her with the toothbrush in the stairwell going like that. And I said, this woman is an expert, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, who does that? Yeah. Only Janie does that. Yeah. She's just a heart of gold and skills of, of you know, a high order. She comes and gives a talk on using non-corrosive stuff to clean your house. It was one of, again, one of the best talks I attended. So, so it was just everybody sharing their skills in a very generous way, which is the magic of creating a structure like this. Yeah. They've given the uh, ability. Uh, lots of groups and clubs. I hope you all visited one of Michelle's mm -hmm. Civil War reenactments yeah. that used yeah. to happen here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was Barbara Beach. And there's Barbara, who I, I wish Barbara was here because poor Barbara was exploited to the fullest. Because I said, with a face like Barbara's, everybody has to give money. <laughs> <laughs> so Barbara would be put right up front when we had our music concerts and the money would flow. And there was one uh, memorable time where poor Barbara had fallen down and she was bruised and we had double the money and I said, I'm going to have to bruise you. <laughs> 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 and, you know, I'm remembering when Quesit Garden opened, I'm thinking it must have been 2011, that we had some kind of a party to celebrate. The, the, the Garden Club. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you had a midnight in the garden. Do you remember? Yeah. Midsummer Nights Garden. Oh, I have The idea that people could come together, conceptualize, participate, donate, volunteer to make these things happen. We're, we're not really sure that this was all going to be successful, but it, it, I remember Barbara selling something or getting Friends memberships. It's like people were just ready to do this. 
Yeah. And you know, I want to mention somebody you and I didn't talk about this when we planned. Can we mention Lee Williams and the Lions oh, Club? Yeah. I mean, he got a lot of support. Well, we got financial support from Lee Williams, um, $25,000 or so. Um, but also the fact that he, um, enga he helped us engage the Lions Club and that, that they became part of all of this. They um, helped us direct traffic and park people's cars and you know, this, this was all happening. Maybe everybody's looking at me. You didn't know that, did you? Karen is looking. No, I know. I remember the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you could join the Lions, then you passed the baton to me, and, and I joined the Lions. <laughs> the real Lions. I mean, the lion, yeah. in the heart of the Lions, the libraries. Yeah. They funded a lot of things. They yeah. funded it, and he was a source of great support. Was, Anytime right. you had trouble, you could consult him. And he came to everything. Right. He came to everything. Mm -hmm. He came to everything. Okay, groups and clubs. Oh, and space, of course. Mm -hmm. Exactly what Madeline just said. It, 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 that, that's exactly what we used to tell everyone who came. <coughs> five minutes, pretend the house is yours because it's not too big, it's not too small, it's just right, like Goldilocks. Yeah. And people use it as their own. I mean, this was my absolute favorite one. Look at that octopus. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you, the kids were going crazy about that. The courtyard, when did that come? Do you remember? It was later, but yeah. it became a... Yeah, we finally cleared it out. Later, let's yeah. just say later. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, it was finalization, like the bathtub was just a couple of years ago when you retired. Yeah. 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 This bathtub has a... That was our bathtub as well. <laughs> well, I hope I'm doing it justice when I plant it each season, but it's, it's between seasons right now, so it's not looking that well. But no. <laughs> thank you for its use. I have a comment about bathtub. <laughs> bathrooms. This house must have 10 bathrooms. Oh I don't know if I ever counted them, but every room, I, I can't remember. I wish we had. I used to rattle off the numbers, but I can't remember how yeah, many bathrooms. Yeah, it might not be 10, but. I think it's good. nine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish we had more um, visual um, idea of what it was like when it was being used by Winthrop Ames. And, you know, these yeah. rooms were furnished. And yeah. mm -hmm. Do you know, Ed, if there are pictures No around? pictures. No yeah. pictures. I've been looking for a year. So. No. Yeah, no idea about the furniture. No. And I can tell you about the furniture. Um, when the Ames' own the Booth Theater in New York, when they closed it down, they got the big picture that's up on the wall at, at uh, Oak James Hall, but the furniture that Edwin Booth used in the green room came here, and Winter Ames used that what, what oh. was here. So that's the, the only story, and I, I keep telling Bill, there must be a barn someplace where the furniture there is. There must be. And and so. the, wherever it is, is the original card catalog from the Ames Free Library. Yeah, that's here, definitely. Also, it disappeared when we no. moved out. Ask Doug King. <laughs> well, the, 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 uh, the catalog that's yeah, downstairs is not the one from the library. Oh. It's from it's from part of the library, or it's from the um, but the branch. But the big catalog disappeared. Yeah, the big ones. Yeah, the big ones yeah. there. Yeah. <coughs> Tell tell us who Edwin Booth is. Remind us. Edwin Booth was the brother of the more famous John Wilkes John. Booth. Oh, uh, that's right. I knew um, there was something. Who had the chutzpah as a as an actor to appear at Ford's Theater after his brother <laughs> oh the, uh, God, no. sold the place out. <laughs> <laughs> It's dark, Mark. It is. Dark. <laughs> 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 okay, now, uh, and then Marion. Now, as Marion mentioned, Madeline and she plotted about this whole, uh, you know, libraries typically don't do major fundraising. They were convinced that the community had to be, you know, the, the culture of giving had to be ingrained in Eastern community. I mean, people were giving their skills generously, but the business of you know libraries don't have money to do fun stuff. They buy, you know, they do what what's required. Marion steps in and just takes off. I have never seen the kinds of events that Marion <laughs> conjured up from that fertile brain. Of course, it would keep accruing. So what we advertised was, oh, there's going to be a gala. By the time the actual day came, there was like lots of things that were being offered that people, okay, Marion, 
tell us about oh, just some of them. It was such a wonderful, inspiring space to, to do events in. Let's face it, beautiful, beautiful, and dresses up very well. Yeah. <laughs> and we had some brilliant talents helping us decorate from well, Gloria Freitas, who recently passed, decorated for this gala. And I can still see her some of her arrangements in the back. I can see yeah. Ines is uh, yeah, yeah. great Gatsby. And this was a January, it was uh, December 31st. It was a huge event. And um, yeah. he, every, it was just packed, and people had some of the, I, I remember Rula saying, this is the best night of my life. Oh, it oh my well, it had ruined my life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was a lot of work. And oh, she is. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. people have been asking about it ever since. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, but a whole bunch of them. I mean, Ed's oh, risk, so many. Ed's risky and, taste. And Ed's, Ed's been a huge part of our events. Yeah. <laughs> and um, a well loved from an Irish figure who's, you know, doing his own whiskey tasting. Mm -hmm. And people have really appreciated that. Yeah to be, right, you know, making those spooky drinks you're so oh, yeah. fond of for Halloween. <laughs> We've had some, we had some wonderful parties here. I don't think the town historian should be connected with whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> well, you notice that lots of things, you know, this is being done everywhere now. Know, Museums have after hours parties. And, yeah. You know, it's a way to engage a kind of com the, the community people who like to go to these events. And it's a very flamboyant way to tell the world, hey, this library is for, for you. Everyone. For you to yeah. have yeah. everything mm -hmm. you yeah. want in life. Yeah. Come here, this is your third space. So, But here people, people also met each other. Right. You know, they came with groups of people. They um, connected in a way that they hadn't. And they took ownership of the library that way. I couldn't find way. this gala because there, there were many more. So oh, there was yeah. also a lot of fundraisers. Mm -hmm. that, that was a... That was a that was a, a, a 18th birthday party, and they had done it like a great oh, right. party. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't have a birthday party like that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the other, I just want to point out this skeleton in the corner yeah. on a swing. We had the services of a brilliant woman, Lois Scanlon, oh. who um, had her own design company, but she just came in and she transformed Queensland House into this. Spider. I mean, it was just incredible. I've never seen anybody do that much work over so much time, so that when you walked in, your jaw dropped, and then people were ready to really get into it. And this was one of the annual ones that, that I really miss Carolyn, Carolyn Cole, Cole, who is no longer with us, but she started this even before we had formally opened she the Learning went. Commons. It was the tea. It, she was, the, it was the tea, the Artisan's mm -hmm. Fair and the tea. Mm -hmm. uh, the number of things that have happened, that these walls have seen now with the community, and yeah. the community has really put its heart into it. So it has been a good space, Madeline, right? Yes. And so mm -hmm. how many of you, oh, all of you do, really, mm -hmm. but the author in residence, mm -hmm. <laughs> which also came about, you know, very providentially, and our first author in residence is Kate Kleist, for those of you who don't know her. She's a children's author who has written more than 30 books, and she offered herself up. She lives up in the mountains in Missouri, uh, and she very, you know, very jokingly, she said, oh, your library looks lovely, because we had tweeted, uh, the children's librarian had tweeted about her book, her recent book. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, I said, why don't you come and give a talk, and I you know, sent her an email. And she said, well, I live in Missouri, uh, but if you have an author in residence, I would love to come. I said, well, we have an old haunted house if you want to <laughs> And Kate turned out to be just this major ambassador for us, who, who has been coming literally every year. She spends a month over here. She gives classes. And there's a lovely essay that she wrote that goes over well, not mostly everything that we've told you, but more and more, and then beautifully written mm -hmm. by a real author. <laughs> She's a good well, writer. Well, She's does everybody reading. know that there's an apartment upstairs? Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, that's I. Re I also remember mm -hmm. a meeting sitting there and saying, "Okay, well, Forest Systems had outfitted an apartment." You know, a bedroom, a bathroom, washer dryer, um, right. Right. and then there's a living room kind of uh, galley kitchen, kitchen up yes. there. Um, you know, what are we going to do? Should we empty it out? And well, no. Well, what can we use it for? Well, we could have people come and stay. And if they have the guts to stay. In what seems to be a haunted house. <laughs> Not everybody reports that it's haunted. <laughs> Only some of the people who stay. But Marion, that, is, that also has been unintended consequences. It's yeah. led to so much of a romance. 
It was one of the uh, uh, authors uh, or an artist who stayed here, started up a little book on ghostly experiences at Crescent House. <laughs> and those pages are filling. <laughs> yeah. you know, we, can add that to we, we had a poet in residence who lives at the Cape, Lucille. Lucille. And she felt something pressing on her while she was sleeping upstairs as a resident of the a residence author. And I think if, if I had been there would have been my shape in the window. <laughs> oh we got to go on. <laughs> but she 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 was <laughs> anyway, but anyway. Lucille did call because then she gave us hundred dollars to fix a railing. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But we've had so many we've had the master main guide. Uh, yeah. And we've had so many wonderful, interesting yeah, characters yeah, yeah. who have taken up residence here. And the advantage of this whole apartment is that they give classes. Now, these are classes that can cost thousands of dollars, and they just give it because they stay here. Yeah. So I love her quote that its current incarnation seems to suit it best. It absolutely does, because those countless decisions, acts of courage, kindness, and wisdom has really turned this into community and the people of Easton has done, literally everyone has, I can't tell you how many people have just kept contributing towards the development of this house. So, Easton can pat itself <laughs> and can live happily <laughs> ever after <laughs> and the story ends here. <laughs> <laughs>I stumbled upon years ago <coughs> uh, the influence that Winter Fames had on Showboat, the novel, and everything that came from it. Uh, he knew Edna Ferber, and she had opened some play on Broadway that bombed. And he said, you, you shouldn't start in New York, you should start as far away uh, as you can, such as on a showboat. <laughs> so, so she never went to the Mississippi. She saw people in the Chesapeake that had worked on showboats and told her stories, and, and that was, you know, where she came about with that, that inspiration. That's where that show came from. Right. Winter Fames. Well, he, Winter Fames, everybody knows, was instrumental in the creation of Broadway. He, in his cronies, um, was, I had him in mind and as a party, you know, somebody who, who did, had a lot of parties and hedonistic parties, I pictured it all, and you, you <laughs> like you know, the, and we're, we're, my balloon. We're actually going to have a couple of days worth of um, programs related to the garden and, and Winthrop. Uh, I'm doing the Winthrop part, and uh, I've discovered he was really tight with the members of the Algonquin uh, yeah, round right. table, Dorothy right. Parker right. and George S. Kaufman. And oh. So he definitely... And he wrote humor for the Lampoon in, as an undergraduate. Is yeah. that right? He, he did. He, actually, he, uh, yeah. he actually wrote the Hasty Pudding play for whatever year he graduated. Oh, okay. And one thing we didn't know until a couple of weeks ago is that he actually acted in, that, in a very small part. So he, really? you know, When's your talk going to be in? It's going to be uh, April 16th at some time in the day. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's, the, what's the story of Babe Ruth in this house? Oh, it's a complicated story, so come to the speech. <laughs> 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 and, and there's going to be another talk on the lovely Crescent Garden. Yes. <laughs> on April 17th, I am going to be speaking about the garden essentially through time and what wow. Winthrop's dream was, where it came from. And I'm learning a lot about Winthrop. Um, yesterday was one of the most interesting things. I've heard about George Arliss. Mm -hmm. I watched two of his movies. The guy is really something. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he would even come to visit Winthrop, meant that Winthrop had to be pretty high ranking. Mm -hmm. That uh, George Arliss had, it just had really very high standards and Winthrop met them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, learning more and more about the people that he was involved with, I think Winthrop is a very complicated person mm -hmm. that we have not as enough idea yet. Mm -hmm. In both Thank of you. your research, can you make sure that the bathtub was used by George Arliss? Yeah. <laughs> Which two films did you see yesterday? I saw um, 
The Good Man, is that what okay, yeah. The Good Man was very good. And um, was that the one with Betty Davis? No, that's The Man Who Played God. The Man Who and Played God. And our film God. club, which meets on Friday nights, every other Friday night on April 19th, is going to be presenting The Man Who Played God. It's the oh, first great. George oh, Arliss film that we've ever played here. But you get into all of this stuff that is now available through technology when he was talking, I was thinking about what a library was like when back in the Pleistocene when I was a little <laughs> child. And then um, I did happen to, uh, through my various travels, I was at Dartmouth during the time where um, John Kemeny wrote Basic. He was happened to be a, uh, a resident of my small town of Edna, and we beta tested the Macintosh. Mm -hmm. They had the Kiewit Center, which was really one of the first internets of all the New England colleges. And um, to look at all of those changes and everything, and now to have in a beautiful historic place all of that technology at your fingertips mm -hmm. is just so amazing. And the forethought that you all had to do this is, is just wonderful. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, being able to meld the history with being modern is, is so important. It, it was, uh, remember the, 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 the sticker we put up everywhere was um, classic exterior tech savvy interior. <laughs> so right. all the tech is sort of hidden in the walls, so you can't see wires and stuff. Uh, and as and much just, as this isn't about tech, but I remember when Madeline took over, when Anna, Annabelle, or Anna, Anna, Lee, Lee. Anna Lee left, and I remember the big thing is we were going to have coffee. And we were going to be able to talk, and people had gatherings. It was just like this whole sea change that Madeline <laughs> I sure did. I was beginning. determined to do certain things. I, because as I said, I had seen these things going on. Yeah. And now, even now, I tell people we have coffee in the library, and they're like, you have coffee. <laughs> 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 you can eat well, in the library. COVID got rid of that for us. And, and yeah. Karen, didn't Madeline, when she was uh, uh, selected as di director, say that I'm going to get the best small library? I, <coughs> I thought you had stole the board. I, I might have said the same things that I just said here. I was determined that, I, I think what I said, because I so believed it, I wanted to live in a town that had the kinds of libraries that I had seen when I was going around trying to sell software. And I wanted to live in a town that had that kind of library. And I was living in Sharon and working in Easton, and they're both kind of old libraries. So I, I guess I decided we're going to have to make it happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a great oh, And I need to just say one more thing, a little shout out to Uma. Oh, my what? God. What? Oh, no, time. <laughs> <laughs> no, keep the thing going. Not many people have your genius. But not many people have your genius. And for you to come down from I think your... I Mala started laughing right for that. <laughs> 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 <That's good. laughs> Not many people would come down from their office and mingle with absolutely everybody, talk to people crying at a at a at their wedding video and ask them to do transfers of videos. I mean, she approached everyone she encountered. She encountered so many people. She mixed and mingled in the community. She got to know them, and bam, they were doing programs. She got this entire community with no effort on my part. So if that's fine, Larry. And she was having fun at, at the same time. Well, so I, that I, is something. I'm going we to had a dream team. We really did, right? Really like, did. I mean, we really did. It was a, we a board that supported, yeah. a town yeah. that supported, a, a staff that was so skilled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we well, and I had thought that we would try to write a book about trying to actually capture what <coughs> it was the, the essence of mm -hmm. what makes a library exceptional. Yes. What is the difference between a well-stocked library, a funded library, um, and an exceptional That's library? Right. And we have, we've had lots of conversations about it. Do you have the answer yet? <laughs> well, I have the, I have my idea, I do. And it, it, I'd love to read that. Well, it now. has to do with this, the personal attention that mm -hmm you give uh, the people who come into the library. And I, I mean, I learned this when I was working in the children's room in the other library and I was uh, helping somebody do homework or something like that. But it was on the feet 
look, you are doing a project on XYZ. This will help you, that will help you, the other thing will help you. Instead of just leaving the people to wander around and figure it out and follow signs. And I've said this to you and other, you know, the people who work in the libraries are pretty smart, right? Mm -hmm. They know they've got master's degrees, they have subject expertise. And to let the, the place function as a self-service institution is fine as far as it goes, but it can do more. I remember when I oh, sorry. Yes, Joy. I just wanted to say as a 46-year neighbor, to me the catalyst of the whole library expansion was the, uh, the, sh the book shuttle trotting uh, out. <laughs> and the, the first one that happened, I said, why are all these crazy people standing out <laughs> in 40 degree drizzle doing this work? But when they brought it back, I was part of the, the, part of the, yeah. the group. Yeah, and crazy. you know, with, because before that, I would bring my kids elementary school and when they said, got to go to the bathroom, I would oh. get scared myself. <laughs> And we wound up going to Stoughton, so I think the catalyst was like what got uh, oh, that, you know, a, an expansion of the, 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 of the spirit. Of the spirit. According to Hazel, before that bathroom, there was a tree, and she's never told me which tree. <laughs> I bet it's a big one out there now. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.